Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the particle in a box model, but we're going to extend that to other dimensions. It's very similar to the case of the one dimension, in the sense that the particle is still confined, but now it's instead of just moving in one dimension, it's, uh, it's free to move in a second dimension. If it was move, free to move first in the, x, in the x axis, now it's also free to move in the y axis. That means the potential inside a certain region limited in between 0 and some distance in x and 0 and some distance in y, the potential should be 0 in that region and it must be infinite anywhere else, so the particle cannot actually move outside of that boundary. One thing to notice is that each of the sides is independent. They don't have to be exactly the same length. So in the most general case, you're going to have a rectangular area, and in a very specific case, you're going to have a square, um, a square plane. Now the particle, uh, the problem can be solved exactly in the same fashion as we discussed before. Remember that we started with the analysis of free particle. Now when we confine the particle inside of a certain region, still inside of that region is free to move. In this particular case, we can then set up our Schrodinger equation in, for, in the following fashion, where now you will notice that the kinetic energy term, the kinetic energy operator, has contributions because the particle is moving in both directions. And so, all the properties related to this system will depend then in two coordinates, the x and the y coordinates. That goes uh, for my kinetic energy, the wave function, and the probability of finding a particle in any particular region of space uh, in this confined plane. Now, how do we solve this problem? Well, there's a technique in mathematics that we call a separation of variables. Now, important before I go into that is that not every single differential equation can be solved this way, but for this one, we know that this is something that we can do. So how does that work? In, in principle, we have a wave function that depends in both coordinates x and y, and we want to express that as a product of two functions, each of which depends only on one of the coordinates, such that my problem uh, is also reflecting the, the fact that the total energy it's going to be contributions for the energy of my particle moving in the x direction and the energy of my particle moving in the y direction. Just as we mentioned here for the kinetic energy operator. Now, a side note, this is basically the separation of variables. It's basically the same idea that we use for whenever we were thinking about the total wave function, that it's time dependent, and we separated that into a wave function that depends only on the position and a function that depends only on time. So something to have in mind is the same idea. If we can express this wave function as the product of two functions, again, that they only depend on their individual variables, when I take the second derivative with respect, for example, of x of this product, then y should be a constant, so I can take it out of the differentiation, and I'm going to take the second derivative only of the function that depends on x. Similarly, in the case of when I apply the second derivative with respect to y of this product of functions, x is a constant, so it can be taken out of differentiation, and the derivative is just going to be with respect to the variable that contains y then my Schrodinger equation, using this fact, can be rewritten in the following fashion. <clears throat> then to simplify this even further, I can multiply everything my, by my y function, which is, remember, the product of those two functions that depend only on each of the variables. With that, I end up with two terms, one depending on x, one depending on y. But added up together, they have to give me a constant. That means, for example, that if I make any changes in y, y in principle should change because it depends on y. But it cannot change, because if it were to change, then this value can no longer be a constant. So, the expression that I get is something that it's only dependent on x, and every parameter will reflect that. By the same argument, you end up having this expression, where now everything is in terms of y, because that has to be constant. That means that using these arguments, we end up with two equations that are ordinary differential equations, single variables, and most importantly, two, two things. One of them, they're eigenvalue equations, and they are exactly of the same form that we had before, and we solved this problem for the particle in a box in one dimension. It's exactly the same equation, the only thing that we're changing now is really the labels, in terms of the solutions. Um, physically, that means that we're analyzing the particle in the y direction, we're analyzing the particle for this one in the x direction. So technically they are different, but they are labels in terms of how we solve mathematically those two expressions. And we know from the one-dimensional case that the wave functions for there are solutions to this equation end up being as the square root of two times the length times a sine function of n pi over the length of the box, and my variable is x in this case. Now I have to put the labels in this length because remember, now we have the length of the box, which is the length on the y axis, x axis, and the length in the y axis. So I have to make a distinction between both of them because we are saying that this part depends only on x. Similarly, the wave function that solves this equation is going to be written exactly the same as the one dimensional particle in a box case, but now I have to add the labels that will correspond to the y dimension 
And remember here, I'm going to be labeling this with my quantum numbers. Those are the numbers that guarantee that the wave function goes to zero at the boundary, so they came from the boundary conditions. But they're going to be labeled as nx and ny, where those two quantum numbers can be changed independently. So the quantization should reflect that, and these two values can in principle be different, although they're constrained to be in the same set of integer, positive integer numbers. So my wave function from the very beginning of the separation of variables is just the product of those two independent solutions. So what I'm going to have in this case is going to be my wave function as the product of those two independent solutions. There we have it. The particle in the box in a three-dimensional case is going to be very similar to what just, we just did using the separation of variables technique. Now my wave function can be written in terms of three functions, each of them depending only on one of the dimensions of my problem, and the total energy will be the contribution from the particle moving in each one of those directions. Similarly, I can write down my Schrodinger equation that where now the Laplacian contains or takes into account that the kinetic energy is coming from movement of my particle in three dimensions. So it's going to be the energy and my wave function. Similarly, separation of variables, similar arguments, I end up with three ordinary differential equations. These two well, all of them, the three of them, are exactly the same as in the case of one-dimensional case, but with different labels. But exactly, these two exactly, we just solved them right about. This one will be a little bit different because we have to change the labels, but remember, the solutions are going to be still exactly the same, of the same kind. So we have my normalization constant, 2 over the length of my box in that direction. It's a sine function, and my quantum number, and my quantum number here, with the label in the z-axis, and then the length of the box in that direction. If we put them all together, we end up now having that the wave function is going to be just the product of all of those put together. What happens with the energy? Well, the energy, in a similar fashion, remember that we already mentioned that the energy is going to be the sum, the contributions from the motion of the particle in each one of those directions. So if we have a two-dimensional case, we're going to have two terms. If we have three-dimensional case, we have three terms. For the 1D, we only have one term, which, by the way, this was the equation that we end up, uh, ended up having for the one-dimensional case. So since those are constant, uh, they're not going to be changing for any um, dimension. We can put them, again, separately as a constant. And the only thing that is going to be changing in this case, remember the quantization number or the quantum number and the length of my box in that particular direction. And so that we can, I can factor out the constant term and then the contributions from each of the directions can be added up together. Similarly, for the three-dimensional case, we have a constant and then we can put the contributions for each of, one dire each of the one directions uh, added up together. And remember, it's going to be the quantum number in that direction square divided by the length of the box in that direction square. And that repeats for uh, the term has exactly the same form for each one of those directions. Okay, so we have now collected the expressions for the wave functions and the expressions for the energies. And then we're ready to do more problems. Wave function for two dimensions, wave function for three dimensions, and the corresponding energies. Okay, uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll talk to you later.